to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen, and with me, as always, my partner in crime, who you know, who you love, Zach Kelberman, fresh off, a day off from the podcast. Of course, Tuesday night is our traditional night off from the pod, but uh, Zach, how you doing, bro? I'm doing pretty well, Chad. I saw you last night. You kind of Your day off was taken up by the BTP pod, but uh, <laughs> for anyone who saw it, it was a pretty good uh, live stream. Yeah, they uh, they dropped some knowledge and and uh, kind of popped their cherry, if you will, of doing the live pod, and they had a great time. It was a great conversation from what I saw after the fact, but yeah, pass the baton to those guys. But you know, I wanted to see if you caught this really quickly, and then we'll we'll dive into some other topics for today, yeah. including the two new hires the Broncos have made since last we talked with our illustrious audience. And by the way, what's up, Stu? Buona Beast, up, Ryan. Uh, let's see who else is in the room. Tony. Oh, Tony had to bounce out. Miller, 707, Noble Young, Red John. Anyway, guys, thanks for joining us. Big Daddy Rock, Kane, Rock, I see you. Did you catch what uh, – now, it was a great article. Who was it? Greg uh, from SI, Bi from the Mothership. Uh, Greg. Bishop. Bishop, thank you. Uh, had a great article where he traveled out to Arizona to meet with Brock Osweiler, spend a little time with him, get some inf information on kind of what he's doing now that he retired. For those of you who missed it, he retired in October – when he found no takers for his services. And of course he would jump right back in today if there was a, a viable offer in the NFL, even as a backup. But I, what was interesting, Zach, I want to read this quote and then I'm going to serve it over to you. And I know just from checking out some of the comments in the stream, a lot of our listeners haven't seen this yet. And by the way, this has been a viral story at MHH all day long. It's been huge, tons of traffic. Here's what Osweiler said. And this is the quote that I clipped from uh, Bishop's story for the MHH article quote, for now, this is setting the stage for think post Super Bowl 50, the new league year is about to start in March, right? Free agency is about to open up. Everyone expected Brock Osweiler to take his rightful place with the Broncos as the successor to Peyton Manning and the new face of the new era of Broncos football under Gary Kubiak, John Elway. Here's what happened quote, For weeks, Elway didn't call. Kubiak did, telling him, Dude, I know you're our guy. And I want to coach you for a long time. The quarterback's agents eventually told him not to answer any call from Elway after a certain cutoff date near the start of free agency. Osweiler wishes he hadn't listened. While out at dinner one night, he saw Elway's number blink across his home screen. His thumb lingered over the talk button, but he let it go. Elway left a message saying he wanted to come to Scottsdale and talk. He sent an offer to his agency three years 39 million dollars and of course close quote brock ended up taking the four-year 72 million dollar deal from the texans because it was 37 million guaranteed but if he could go back in time zach he would do it differently quote here's what osweiler told bishop i wouldn't even have picked up john's call i would have called john two weeks before that and told him listen i want to be a bronco until i die if you want me let's get this done close quote and zach this kind of i've always kind of felt that Basically, that was a fateful decision for Osweiler. He ended up going to Houston. We all, we all know the story. But had he stayed with the Denver Broncos, taken that deal, stayed, been the guy, he would have had a Super Bowl roster ready to roll. And even he wistfully said, quote, we might have won the Super Bowl the next year, close quote. Your thoughts, Zach? A lot of it's hindsight now to me, Chad. It's like it's funny these comments are coming out after he's retired. Where was this revelation when he was still playing? Obviously, you know, he cared about his employment. But, you know, back then with the way John Elway was run running the Broncos with the coaching staff, one hand did not know what the other was doing. It's different than now where all of Elway's lieutenants under him kind of have an idea of where he wants to go with the team and what he's thinking. That's different back then. It was his sole call to move on from Osweiler, it was his sole call to construct the team the way he wanted it. So I'm not surprised that there's some sour grapes. I'm not surprised that he has some regret, Brock Osweiler, but he did still win a title. He did still make a lot of money in the NFL, and I think he had a nice career for himself. So I wouldn't be um, biting the hand that feeds him even after the fact. Yeah, it's hard to feel sorry for a guy who made over $41 million in the yeah. NFL when it was all said and done. But, yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate for, for Osweiler the way it shook out because – you know, he eventually got the opportunity to come back in 2017 on the veteran minimum, which was a far cry from what the Broncos were willing to pay him 18 months prior. But at that point, he had changed. Everything he had transpired in, in Houston and Cleveland had made an imprint on him. He wasn't the same person, Zach. And the Broncos, by that point, clearly weren't the same team. Kubiak had been jettisoned. 
many right. of the the star role players from that Super Bowl 50 and even 2016 defense were gone. New head coach and in, in Vance Joseph, new system, the whole nine yards, that ship had sailed. And that's what I'm saying. It, it's all after the fact now, and I'm sure looking back on it, he wanted a chance to kind of win a ring on his own volition, not ride the coattails of a, of a Hall of Famer like Peyton Manning. But I still say that he had a nice career for himself. He made a lot of money and won a ring. Could have been worse. And I think um, just the way Elway did things back then, it was solely he was the czar of the team, whereas now he's taking more input. But back then, he was driven by his ego and driven by what he thinks was best for the organization. And obviously that wasn't including Brock Osweiler. Big Daddy Kane had to pop in, pop out with a $10 donation. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Wanted to say, what's up, guys? Got to get back to work. I'll catch you tomorrow. and Go Niners. <laughs> That's right. It's only a few days away. Big Daddy Kane, you are the man. We appreciate you. Yes. I want – there's a couple more things I want to talk about on Osweiler. First, though, just really quick, let me just get a couple of quick matters of business out of the way, guys. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter. As a reminder, at Huddle Up Pod, simply the best way, as you know, keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with this show in real time. And then don't forget to head on over to Apple podcasts and leave a creative review. If you like what Zach and I are doing, leave us a five-star rating. It's a great organic way to support the show and it helps to get the show out to new listeners in Broncos country. So take care of that. All right, Zach. The other thing, I mean, as far as Osweiler, here's one thing that kind of bothers me. He's kind of turned into like a, a bit of an NFL or a football clown, if you will. And I think it comes down to that trade, right? The the Texans gave up him plus a second round pick. And there might've even been one, one other piece of uh, another asset that was dealt to Cleveland, basically just to get his contract off the books. Yeah. And the thing that people forget is even though his numbers that year, that 2016 season in Houston, weren't anything to write home about. He had, I think three more interceptions than he did touchdowns. It was a lopsided TD to interception ratio. However, the Texans won a division cha- championship that year. Like they, it's not right. like they were, he fell flat on his face and it was just a, you know, complete botched fail in Houston. The, the reason it didn't work out was because he and Bill O'Brien just simply didn't hit it off. He wasn't Bill O'Brien's guy. He was the previous GM's guy, Rick Smith. Right. And it was never the guy that, that O'Brien wanted. And they clashed and probably Osweiler, as we know, at that particular fork in the road, that point in time, he was feeling his oats, man. He was thinking, man, I, it should have been me leading this team into the playoffs. It should have been me playing in the Super Bowl, you know, neglecting the the reality that had it not been Peyton, they probably don't get past the Pittsburgh Steelers in the divisional round. And they sure as heck probably don't get past the New England Patriots in the AFC Championship game, let alone win the Super Bowl. But not, nevertheless, at that point in time, he was so miffed over what happened that he was willing to listen to every little thing that his agents told him and completely spurn the advance, which again, as you said, Elway could have ponied up and competed with the offer the Texans gave him. But at the same time, Osweiler could have been a lot more amenable to the offers yeah. and the overtures that the Broncos were making to stay home with a super. I mean, Houston's never won a Super Bowl. I mean, they've never even been to an AFC championship game. And here he was given the opportunity to be the next franchise quarterback for the Denver Broncos and not for peanuts either. Even though 13 million per year, I mean, comparatively, especially just a few years down the road, even now, is peanuts compared to, you know, what a franchise caliber quarterback is making out there. Still, it's not like he was being asked to come back and pay on a play on a veteran minimum like he ended up doing 18 months later. But nevertheless, he gets treated like a clown. And I think it really boils down to that trade. Zach, the trade in which the Texans just telegraphed, basically, this is a turd that we want to get off our front porch. Take him just so we can clear this money off the books. Here's a second round pick. I think Osweiler's valuation of himself did not match the valuation of around the NFL. I think yeah. he was worth a lot more than he really was. And maybe he was fed that information by his agents and got some faulty information, but he was led astray. And uh, his play never justified that. He had a good stretch with the Broncos in that Super Bowl season, but he never st- – developed into that franchise signal caller that was worthy of that big contract that was worthy of those commitments and i think he thought he was so what boiled down to was his own ego which is funny because it went up against elway's ego and elway won out so all looking back it's all hindsight it, it worked out for denver they won a ring that year uh Oswald made a lot of money so it could have been worse they went their separate ways and uh i think it all worked out pretty well in the end there was an interesting little <clears throat> excuse me anecdote in that piece by bishop and by the way you guys Go check out that article. If you need to find it, you can go to milehighhuddle.com. The link is in that Osweiler story we have up right now. But he he shares a little anecdote, does Bishop, and I'm sure obviously got this from Osweiler, but 
that after that week 17 game <clears throat> in which he started the game and then was benched for Peyton Manning, Peyton came in in the second half and brought the Broncos back from a deficit, ended up winning and securing the number one seed. And from then on out, it was once again, of course, Peyton's, Peyton's team. And of course, that is the one and only game in on the resume of Peyton Manning that he participated in, in which he was not the starter. It was the first and only time in his career that he spent a regular season game or started a regular season game as the backup, the listed backup. But after that game, Osweiler talked about when it happened, when he got the, the when Kubiak came and said, Hey, we're sitting you down, you know, we're going back to Peyton, the crushing disappointment and the pit of his stomach. And there's, there's a whole interesting little window into his, his world. But he talked about how after the game, Zach Kubiak brought him into his office and said, you know, basically tried to console him said he wept on his shoulder. He was basically crying to Kubiak, and he, Kubiak told him he loved him like a son, pointed to his little fridge in his office and said, there's plenty of beer in there. Drink as many as you want. <laughs> and Osweiler said he put back a few beers and then went out and faced the media. But kind of interesting just to just to go behind the, you know, the curtain for a minute and just see some of the emotions of a young guy who, let's face it, he had bided his time for three and a half years, and he felt like he'd done a good enough job. But I'm sorry – it's the sheriff, dude. You, you got to know your place. And he wasn't ready. And Elway, I don't blame Elway for not rolling out the red carpet because what was it? Seven starts. He went five and two as a starter in 2015, did Osweiler. And even though it was impressive, he still got benched. So you got to keep that in mind. I think it was a good look for Gary Kubiak. What a likable, relatable guy just to offer some beer to a young player who is uh, you know, down on himself right now. And But that shows to me the disconnect, Chad, back then between Kubiak and the front office. It seemed like maybe Kubiak was in Osweiler's corner more than Elway was. It just didn't seem like things were cohesive as they are now, which brings us to reality, and that's why it's encouraging. Under Vic Fangio, under the new John Elway in his uh, turned over the new Leaf general manager role, he's really including everyone in the decision-making process, and that's why you'll see more continuity going forward. So it's a new Elway now, but seeing those stories and those anecdotes back then take us back to when he was still ego-driven and making decisions based on impulse. But I agree with you. He was absolutely right in not just poning up the money, writing a blank check. It worked out the best for Denver. You have to tip your, your cap to Elway for that. I mean, the Broncos... They tried with Osweiler, and then they went with Paxton Lynch, and it was a massive failure and a bust. And since then, they basically, well, up until week 13 of this past season, they've been wandering the, the QB desert, yeah. if you will. And they finally, you know, I mean, if if losing out on Osweiler and then Osweiler's career going to, to crap in the process, if all those dues the Broncos had to pay after hoisting the Lombardi trophy, trophy at the end of Super Bowl 50 – led them to Drew Locke, who can be the guy for this team for the next 10, 15 years, if not longer, the way quarterbacks are played in the NFL right now, then it's all a price worth paying at the end of the day. It's like the Kansas City Chiefs. They were lucky enough that they went from being a, from a winning quarterback and a winning program to a young franchise quarterback out of the gates and just kept winning, going from Alex Smith era to Patrick Mahomes era. But most teams, and you know the Colts had a similar thing, Peyton to Andrew Luck. Most teams, though, you know, especially after you hoist the Lombardi trophy and a rebuild follows kind of like the Broncos back after Elway retired, you got to go through the desert. You got to pay your dues. You got to wander. You got to find the, the, you know, where the water's at, find that oasis. And eventually the Broncos did. And that's the upside. I mean, and you're looking at the fact that I believe most fans, and I think Elway would actually admit, he would take three years of, of waiting those desert, those sands to find that franchise guy. If you're going to give up three years after winning a ring to find the guy that leads you for the next 10 to 15 years, maybe bring in more world titles to Denver, I think he would take that trade off. So it all worked out for Denver in the end. Unfortunately, we're not still speculating on Osweiler. We're not speculating, speculating on another veteran quarterback. They have their young guy in the system now. We have to move forward with the, the current Broncos. By the way, Albert, you have to, it's through YouTube only. You got to watch the watch through YouTube and there's a super chat feature. So if you want to do that, by all means, we absolutely appreciate it. Mile high truth here says coulda, woulda, shoulda. If I was 10 feet tall, I'd be a good basketball player. If I was a billionaire, I would own an island. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Amen to that brother. But yeah, so just a really interesting piece. You know, Brock Osweiler has a piece of Broncos history, you know, a little fraction of, of the tapestry belongs to him and he contributed. I mean, he, if it's not for Brock Osweiler, the, the Broncos don't have that third Lombardi trophy. So he should, in my opinion, despite the way things ended, he should have some respect in Broncos country. But nevertheless, let's move on to current concerns for the Denver Broncos. First and foremost, the team finally, you know, made the hire. Mike Shula is the quarterback's coach. 
Finally. Or, I mean, we've already kind of hammered this into the ground, you know, talked about Mike Shula. It was in the works for as, as long as two weeks. I just want to read one thing to you real quick, Zach, and then we'll move on from Vic Fangio, what Fangio said about the Mike Shula hire. This is from Fangio quote, Mike is a well-respected coach around the league, especially when it comes to developing quarterbacks. The fraternity he has with Pat Shermer is an added bonus, but what's most impressive is Mike's proven track record coaching quarterbacks at many different stages of their careers. We're fortunate to add someone with his depth of experience, coaching ability, and unique perspective to our staff, close quote. The thing that jumps out to me there, Zach, he ha- he's well-respected, especially when it comes to, underline this part, everybody, developing quarterbacks. Look at the bold words, the key points there. Experience, proven, you know, quarterback development, everything that Scangarello wasn't, everything the Broncos wanted him to be, and that's exactly why they replaced him. So it's a good look for the Broncos, and it's a good uh, continuity-type move to bring in his underling, Shula, for Shermer as well. So quarterback development, it's all about Drew Locke for this offseason, as well it should be, and it's encouraging, Chad, that they're not just talking about it, they're being about it, they're making moves to supplement Drew Locke's development. I love to see it. Same here. A. Morrow says, shout out to the BTB guys last night. They did well. Chad should allow them to go live more often. <laughs> allow. You know, it's it's one of those things, guys, where there's there's only seven days in a week, right? And we we um, there's a couple slots open, and the dudes, they chose Tuesday, and, and so that's what they're going to do. And who knows? We're, we're not going to rule out the possibility that more podcasts or more than one live pod could come, you know, during a single day. But we are governed by the reality that uh, there's only seven days in the week. All right. The second thing, and then we'll grab some of these super chats and other questions that are coming in is the Broncos finally announced who they had in mind to replace their cap wizard, Mike Sullivan, who we learned last week, the team did not intend on renewing his contract. It's, it has expired. And the Broncos landed on a fella by the name of Rich Hurtado. Now let me just read this first little part of the press release on her on Rich Hurtado quote, Hurtado has 15 years of experience negotiating contracts as a team executive or player agent. So he's done it from both sides of the table. He spent the last 11 years as an agent slash executive for the Creative Arts Agency, CAA, formerly five-star athlete management after four seasons working in football administration with the Philadelphia Eagles. So not only has he worked for the biggest or one of the biggest sports agents uh, agencies, but he also spent time working under Howie Roseman as a cap analyst. And eventually, uh, you know, he had a bigger title um, for the Philadelphia Eagles. So your thoughts on the Bronx, we don't, other than that, other than what is known in, in the press release, Zach, that the Broncos provided to us, <clears throat> all we know is that the Broncos were exposed to him. It wasn't just a resume that came across Elway's desk. They were exposed to him through his involvement in the negotiation of the Broncos contracts with Aqib Tlaib. When they signed him in 2014, he was a part of that negotiation. Demarius Thomas's extension in 2015, and then the Emmanuel Sanders extension in 2016. I mean, yeah, he has some Broncos ties going way back. But one thing that I read that I was encouraged by was he either worked with or was familiar with Todd France, who's representing Justin Simmons. So that's a really good in to have, a really good connection to have to lock down Simmons this offseason. I like the hire, Chad. It was tough to replace Mike Sullivan because I, I thought he was really good at his job. But they arguably found a guy who's on his level. He has a lot of connections around the NFL uh, with a team like the Philadelphia Eagles, who you mentioned worked under a really savvy cap guy in Howie Roseman. So if you're going to learn to learn from the best, can't hurt the Broncos. I like this move a lot. I want to see it translate, though, not just for new deals to the players this offseason, but more team-friendly deals, Don't, not a lot of dead money left on the cap, not a lot of heavy guarantees, record-setting deals. I want to see how he negotiates his contracts compared to how Sullivan did it before. Right. Yeah, it's going to be – this. This free agent period is going to be really interesting. And by the way, Stu jumps in with the ten dollars donation Thank on you, Super Stu. Chat, our biggest superstar Thank on you. Super Chat. Appreciate you, Stu. And he says wants to know thoughts on the new financial guy. And I mean, that's the thing is you you have to wonder. Like at first, I I kind of was was fed information that as far as like the Juwan James contract as an example last year, that was frankly when you look at it in hindsight, and even when it was when it was executed. When you looked at his resume in terms of how much time he missed as a player, you kind of start worrying a little bit about whether or not the Broncos got too far out over their skis on that contract and opened themselves up to too much risk. Turns out he appears in three games in his first year as a Bronco, and it was basically just a bunch of money that the team poured down the drain for nothing. 
you have to wonder how much of that was just simply Mike Sullivan saying, here's the structure, here's what we're willing to offer, let's negotiate, and then Elway just kind of rubber stamping it as opposed to Elway saying, here's the structure, now go negotiate the terms type thing. It sounds like more to me, Zach, the reality is that was the job of Mike Sullivan, not only to manage the cap, but to structure player contracts. And of course, the GM has to sign off on that when it's all said and done. Elway does own accountability for that. But there is a possibility, what I'm getting at here, is that there could be an improvement with Hurtado joining, as much as we both thought Mike Sullivan, for a lot of those years, did a great job for the Broncos. There is the possibility that you might be able to see some some different improved results that yes. are more favorable to the Broncos with, with Hurtado in the fold. The thing about the James contract, a lot of it was fueled by desperation as well. They tried for so many years to land the right tackle, and they finally found a guy they don't have to trade for. He's still young in his prime, so they handed him a contract that was commiserate, commiserate to the market value. It just was a lot of money for not that reliable of a player. But like you said, I want to see how Hurtado, his contract structure differs from Mike Sullivan. We see how the Broncos have kind of uh, front-loaded contracts, very incentive-heavy contracts, and it's well and good when it works out, but when it doesn't, it blows up in their face. I want to see how he differs, even though Elway, like you said, will have the final call. It all goes through him, but I want to see how much power he has consolidated within the organization to structure things a different way. Let's grab a couple other questions here from uh, Wayne Walker on Facebook. He says, who do you see as Locks backup? Love the show. Can't wait to get a hat. And the hats are coming to the merch store Hopefully by this weekend, we have the logos getting made right now, and then they'll be delivered to us, and then we can put them on the merch store and different things. So the hats are coming, by the way. Go pick up a hoodie. Um, amen. Who do you see as locks back up in 20, 2020? Is it going to be someone currently on the roster? Do you think they sign someone, draft someone? <laughs> I don't think they, they they sign a free agent. I don't think they obviously use a high-round pick on a quarterback. I think it's going to be Brandon Allen when it's all said and done. I think that third position, Brett Rippon versus a, maybe a, a rookie quarterback in the sixth or seventh round, I can see that playing out. But I think Brandon Allen, he has experience. He knows the system. And Drew Locke, as long as he's the guy, I don't want a high-profile backup behind him. I, that's why I don't want an Eli Manning or a Tyrod Taylor, whatever. I wanted just Drew Locke and literally no one else behind him. Have a guy as a safeguard like Brandon Allen who can step in and win a game, as we saw, as a pinch starter, but no one that's going to take away the flair or the headlines from Drew Locke. Could not agree more, which is why you know, I'll be surprised if the Broncos don't add a quarterback at least early for a camp arm, whether it's late in the draft or as a college free agent to compete and kind of push the the competition behind Locke. But you got Allen as a restricted free agent. So mm. it does kind of make sense for the Broncos to just go ahead and tender him, re-sign him as an RFA, depending on the cost. We, we'll have to examine that with Bob Morris one of these days. But even if it's for a couple million no, for, for, the, for 2020, knowing that you got a guy that if something happens, he can step in for one to three games and, right. and you know, carry the torch – Asking anything more than that from him, you're you're you know just begging for it. And then, if by some chance Zach the Denver Broncos uh, go into training camp and they allow Brett Rippon to truly compete with Allen and he beats him out, and then you don't you know maybe you cut him and you don't have to pay that two million, whatever it shakes out to be. But I think that the backup quarterback to Drew Locke in 2020 was on the roster in 2019, and it's not Joe Flacco. Thank God for that. And I see a comment here from Mile High Truth. He says, Brandon Allen and Shermer's system. No, but here's the reality, guys. If Drew Locke goes down, the Broncos season's over anyway. It doesn't matter who they have. He is their franchise guy. So if it's Brandon Allen, Brett Rippon, whoever want, I see Chase Daniel in the comment there. If Locke goes down, the Broncos season's going down. So we have to hope he's healthy, and that's why the Broncos have to make sure he remains healthy. Just what I want to say. By the way, Mark, <clears throat> appreciate the uh, the donation on Super Chat, my brother. Yes. Um <laughs> we got a lot of love for you too, brother. We got a lot of love yes. for you too. All right, let's see what else we got here from our friend. <clears throat> um, Trick Lessons, he said, $5 donation. Thanks, brother. He says, I wish okay. Osweiler would have stuck it out. He fit in Kubiak's system and would have developed differently than what he did in Houston. And that kind of, thanks again, brother, for the for the donation yes. and support. That kind of brings up an interesting question that was posed to me on Twitter today. And I apologize. I don't have time to go up and find out. I don't remember offhand who it was that posed it to me. But it was which – would you have preferred to to see happen? Brock Osweiler not leave, so Brock Osweiler stays in Denver, or Gary Kubiak doesn't resign. And my answer was, if Brock Osweiler returns to the Denver Broncos, there's a good chance he 
Gary Kubiak does not resign at the end of the 2016 right. season. So again, it's one of the woulda, shoulda, couldas. You never, we're never really going to know how how it would have shaken out or how it could have. But I remain still to this day. I think it would have been a different story for both the Broncos and Brock Osweiler had he stayed in Denver. But we're just simply never going to know. And if he would have stayed in Denver, he wouldn't have seen Paxton Lynch in Denver more than likely. So that would have avoided that disaster. But yeah, it's all hindsight. And it's like Chad mentioned, a snowball effect there. One thing had to lead into the other and they were exclusive. So you just it's fun to speculate about, but it doesn't change history. And uh, they were tied together. So it worked out the way it worked out. Our friend Jordan jumps in with a $5 donation on Super you, Chat. Appreciate you, Jordan. We'll keep an eye out for any of your comments and questions in the stream here. Let me jump through because today we have to keep it a, a little bit uh, – a little bit shorter than usual. Albert as well, $10 donation. Thank you, Thank you my friend. Appreciate you. We love you. Uh, let's see. Then we'll, we'll get to the questions. There's one more down here I saw from Hunter. Jumps in, $10 donation on Super Chat. Thank you, Hunter. Can I hop in on a third screen one day? I have a sweet Rod Smith jersey <laughs> I could wear. Well, you know, Hunter, not to, uh, you know, in all seriousness, we've considered different things, uh, different ways we can include our awesome audience even more so in our programming. That's something we've considered occasionally bringing on a fan. We haven't quite ironed out the details of what we want to do there, but just know Hunter that it's uh, it's in the hopper. We are absolutely considering it. So, and when we make a decision like that, of course you guys will be the first to know. Um, let's grab this one from Bronco broad on YouTube. Is the verbiage different in Shula's offense that seemed to be locks only hang up when he was learning the West coast offense. So just, just, you know, as a matter of being literal here, it's going to be Shermer's offense. And Shula worked with Shermer the last two years for the Giants. So that's going to be a simple, easy thing for the two of them to convey to Locke. But it's all based on the same, you know, one of the biggest things when you jump from the college to the pros is like in college, it's the calls are so simplified to the point where a quarterback can be on the field, right? Zach can look to the sideline and you can hold up a board yeah, giant a cards. Yeah. And you know what the play call is. Whereas you get to, the NFL and you've got sometimes six or seven different words within a, within a play call that all mean different things and are speaking to different, you know, the offensive line, the tight end, what his job is, the Z receiver, the X receiver, the running backs. And so it's a, it's a big learning curve for quarterbacks who never had to do that. And, you know, Locke was helped a little bit by that last year he had at Missouri working with Derek Dooley and a little bit more pro style offense. However, for the most part, Zach, he was a novice, but the good news is, Having learned um, Scangarello's offense last year and the base verbiage, there's going to be a few things in which Shermer and Shula's uh, you know, nomenclature are slightly different. Right. But at the end of the day, it's going to be so similar. I don't see that being anything more than a you know, few hours worth of study and some practical application out on the field. And their job, too, as coaches, they're going to try and keep it as similar to, for Locke as, as possible as well. Yeah, a lot of it will remain the same, actually. The terminology, the language to the system. Plays will be different, obviously, but having, like Chad said, the, the, the experience in Scangarello's system and also the fact that he changed coordinators and systems in college like he changed underwear, that's going to help him also. He has a history of that, of, of rolling with the punches. That's why I firmly believe the Broncos would not have made this move so suddenly if they did not think Locke could adapt to it. And uh, I think having that go-between with Shula and Shermer is going to help him because he can focus on just... Drew Locke, just the quarterbacks, where Shimmer runs the entire offense. So someone he's familiar with can help him relay the information more, maybe down on the field as opposed to having them one in the box. So it's going to be, uh, I would say, a mostly seamless transition from Scangarello to Shermer for Drew Locke. This one comes from Buck and Bronco 58. What quarterback do you think ends up with the Chargers, and will they be a threat next year to the Broncos' playoff chase? That uh, Tom Brady, to me, that's one that jumps to mind because, you know, he's has roots in California. They're a veteran, I think, quarterback away from competing. I can see Tom Brady there for sure, Chad, but I think Justin Herbert, if they go the draft route, that's their guy as well. I believe ultimately they have Tyrod Taylor. They'll probably draft a young guy like Herbert and use that bridge system. That's the most likely scenario that I see playing out. I agree. There, it, If it's not Herbert, it'll be someone else pretty high up in the draft unless Tom Brady chooses to go to L.A., which he very well, he, he might. I mean, his family, I'm, I'm not sure if the Brady family still resides in California. If I'm not mistaken, though, it was Northern California, somewhere close to the Bay Area. But nevertheless, being in Los Angeles is a hop, skip, and a jump, and significantly closer to if his family, the Bradys, and mom and dad, they're still living up north in California, significantly closer for Tom and his, and his kids to be close to grandma and grandpa than it is being across 
the continent entirely, 3,000 miles away in Boston. So, you know, there's a part of me that's like, would Tom Brady really go to the LA Chargers? But then there are some things where you're like, well, you know, I mean, if you if you look at what Peyton Manning was evaluating back in 2012 when he chose to come to the Broncos, they were coming off an 8-8 eight and eight season. They were carried by a, the youth of the roster for the most part. He knew there was a couple of talented young wideouts, a franchise left tackle in Ryan Clady, you know, a gritty defense that had guys like Champ Bailey and Vaughn Miller on it. And so there were some pieces in place where you just needed the franchise quarterback. You can make the argument, Zach, that exists in L.A., but still to this point, I'm going to be stunned if Tom Brady, if he plays anywhere other than New England in 2020. We'll see. Also, the fact that L.A. is a huge media market for Brady, and you know he's all about that type of appearance and doing different things off the field. He has that that business, the TB12 business. I'm sure they like to have a bigger operational headquarters. That would be in L.A. So um, I could see it working out there, but I believe right now, as of January 29th, I think the Chargers will draft a first-round quarterback and then have Tyrod Taylor as that bridge. Cody says, it would be cool if you guys could release a graphic at the beginning of each week showing the dates, time, and content being released for that week. That's not a bad suggestion. One thing until that time comes, or if and when that time comes, until then, Cody, one thing to keep in mind is you're gonna. it's going to always be close to 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We're not sure if we're going to have a live pod. At this point, there is no live pod plan. And then Saturday is the only day that deviates from that programming in which you're going to have Dove Valley Deep Divers going like around 1 p.m. out and 3 p.m. Eastern. But we'll definitely, you know, it's not a bad idea, Zach. We can take it under consideration. Yeah, for sure. I think that would be, a, uh, I think a lot of the followers would appreciate that. So we can try to work that in there. Man, the comment stream just jumped on me. Bear with me here, guys. I had one I was going to grab. Let's see what Damian Clark says, one of our super chat superstars from a couple days ago, he says, while listening to the guys last night, they're leaning towards drafting the skill position when the O-line is not up to par, especially when you look at the teams in the Super Bowl. Your thoughts? Again, I remain adamant that, you know, their their expertise for guys like Nick and Carl and Eric, you know, their expertise is draft and, and personnel, and, and I almost always defer to them. However, they're telling me, that this is the deepest wide receiver class ever, all right? And if that's the case, yes, there's some top-heavy studs at the at the very top, but this isn't a, a class where they're, you know, you go get past the first three or four guys. I was listening to uh, Daniel Jeremiah, of course, who is the new Mike Mayock for NFL uh, Network, NFL Media. He said that there are guys 21, you know, when he was ranking his wide receivers for this class, he said there's guys down as far as 21 who, you know, it's hard to say they're that much better than some of the guys he's got ranked in the top five. So my point being, why would you go out and spend a premium or at least a first round pick on a wide receiver when you could get a guy of a commensurate talent skill or, you know, level Zach the next round or even day three or, you know, late day two, let's just say. And instead, as, as he's talking about here, Get that offensive lineman if you've got one within your grasp in the first round. Grab that D-line. Just grab a blue-chip guy in that first round and then get the skill position guy later. Take advantage of the depth of this class. I, I tend to agree with that, Chad. The only thing I'll add is if the Broncos fall in love with the prospect, if they feel like they have to have the guy, regardless of the position, they should go out and get him. If that means trading up a few spots, so be it. But if it's a lineman, if it's a, a wide receiver, if it's a defensive back, if they want that guy, they need that guy, go get him. But I'm not about to put the Broncos and shoehorn them into a certain spot so many months out of the draft. But through all the, the pre-draft process has to play out, they're going to get – one of the two, I think, either a lineman or wide receiver in round one or defensive back. One of their big three biggest needs will be filled. Whether that goes is how the board falls at 15. If they're not going to they're gonna take the best player available and go from there. I don't think they're going to make one determination until they see how the picks play out. Fair. Terry says, uh, jumps back in, $5 donation on Super Thank you, Chat. Appreciate you, Terry, one of our superstars. Props for getting all three shows live. The MHH team rocks. Same with Broncos Country. Go Broncos. Well, we appreciate that, Terry. You, Terry. One of the reasons why it's just not so simple and why it took time to get every show to be a live podcast is because one of the joys of just re of, of being a, you know, having a podcast is you can schedule and record them behind the scenes whenever you want. Like Zach and I, for example, before we decided to start going live, you know, we could choose when and where, what days, what time around our leisure. 
But when you're going live, you kind of have to pick, pick specific times so that you can, you know, your audience can know when to expect you and you can try and reach as much of your audience as possible at a fortuitous time where it all makes sense. And so it just takes time for everyone's schedules to get up to speed. And, and as you say there, I'm glad too, that we're able to get everybody going live. It's, it's, we're just scratching the surface and we're looking forward to where this thing can go. Let's grab Cottonmouth 78 jumps in $10 donation on Thank super you. chat. Thanks brother. How will a Pat Shermer offense utilize a great player like Jana when it's not a fullback friendly offense? Well, honestly, Zach, I'm not sure that they will utilize right. him all that much. He'll be on the roster. He'll play special teams, but his days of having a major offensive role appear over. And I, I, that's the one thing I disliked about the Shermer hire is that they're not going to utilize the fullback. And Janovich has established himself among the best fullbacks among a dying breed in the NFL. So he'll be on the roster. He'll contribute every now and then, but don't look for him to be on the field every snap. A lot of one back, three tight end looks, three wide receiver looks, excuse me. Right. Yeah. And, and he's, you know, they're on, they're on the hook for some money now that they paid Jano and they didn't know at that time that they would be moving on from Scangarello. So, you know, if Shermer's the offensive coordinator last, you know, September, maybe uh, I'd be willing to bet money. In fact, the Broncos probably don't end up giving Janovich an extension. Maybe yeah. they do just because of the overall value he presents, but it will be interesting to see how they graft him in because He's an impact guy. It doesn't matter where you line him up. You could probably even put Jano at linebacker and he would make an impact. He's just that kind of a Swiss army knife. So the Broncos will find something for him, but the days of him lining up on, you know, for 20 snaps in every single game and, and being an ISO blocker, those days are done. All right. One more guys. And then we got to get out of here for tonight it comes from clay. He says, I've basically fallen in love with Lloyd Cushenberry from LSU from the video the other day. I think he's worth pick 15 thoughts. You know, Zach, if by the if by the time the draft rolls around, the Denver Broncos have made the decision to let Connor McGovern go, and they're at that point deciding to just let someone on the roster and a future draft pick compete, whether it's Patrick Morris or you know even Dalton Reisner, whoever they end up choosing, I would not be too. I, I shouldn't say too disappointed. I wouldn't be disappointed if Lloyd Cushenberry were the pick at fifteen. It's not typically centers, not necessarily, uh, especially, you know, top half of the first round. It's not traditionally a, a position that you want to or is often utilized or taken in the first round. But that Cushionberry was really impressive. Obviously, his career at LSU stands and speaks for itself in the tape he put on there. But his day, his week at the Senior Bowl was phenomenal. It'll be interesting to see how he does, you know, at the Senior Bowl and or at the uh, Combine, et, et cetera. But yeah, I wouldn't be completely disappointed, but I'll still be surprised if they ended up taking a center slash interior guy in round one. Who they can probably trade down in a few spots and still yeah. get around 20 or so, pick up an extra pick. I, I wouldn't be heartbroken over it, but is he better than Worfs for the Broncos? No. Worfs can play left and right tackle. He can even play guard if you wanted him to. So um, he's not higher on my list than Worfs or Ruggs or Akuda, any of them. Cushionberry, I wouldn't cry about, but that's definitely like Chad said, not my first uh, preference. But Cushenberry is a very good player. And, you know, when when mock drafts first started coming out last year, especially after the Senior Bowl, you saw Dalton Reiser in the first round regularly. He ended up going in the second round. And it wouldn't surprise me if a guy like Cushenberry ends up being a fringe first rounder, early second rounder, and That's he might point. be able to – Broncos might have a play at him. They could maybe, if they wanted to, package one of those third-round picks that th they have three right now, move up into the second round, grab a guy like him. But we'll see. Uh, Sky Ace 81 says, why do you think fullbacks are a dying breed? It all comes down to Sky Ace, the spread offense. The NFL for the last decade has been trending away from the predominant West Coast offense, which is about condensing the formations, condensing the field uh, to spread where they're trying to spread defenses out. And when you do that, your job is to get more receivers on the field, hence to be able to use their speed and, and the formation itself to spread the defense out. So when you have three wide receivers on the field, one tight end, one running back, there's not a spot for the fullback. You know, you're basically sacrificing what that fullback could do in your running game in order to have the threat of the pass and that third wide receiver out there to either run a route or spread or take the attention of a DB and spread the field and create, you know, zones of open zones, so to speak. So that's the biggest reason, honestly, why fullbacks have been phased out is the NFL is going pass and they're going yeah. spread. Yeah, you nailed it, Chad. It's a very pass-happy league for the last, like he said, 10 years or so, and there's not a lot of 
two back backfields, meaning a blocker for a running back. If there's a running back in today's NFL, they're either going to be a lone guy like a Todd Gurley or they're going to be in a committee role like what you see with the 49ers. There are not a lot of fullbacks in the backfield. 20 years ago, it was all the rage. It was a running sport even before that, up until the last 10 years. But now that's why Janovich is among the best. There's not many to choose from. It's a truly going the way of the Dodo Bird. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sorry we got to keep this one relatively tight. I mean, I guess we are at 40 minutes, but it, it felt like a really short conversation. But that's because you guys help make this so much fun. And when you're having fun, as you guys know, time flies. Yeah. But uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. Make sure you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. And then don't forget to head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave a creative review. And as always, if you like what you're seeing here, you're watching on YouTube, you're watching on Facebook, you're watching on Periscope, Share this video out. It's a great organic way to support the work we're putting in for you guys on the daily. And then Zach and I will be back in the saddle tomorrow night, same time, 6 p.m. Mountain. T apologies, we were a little bit late today. That was mostly my fault, although Zach was complicit as well. Don't just blame me. <laughs> but uh, we'll be back in the saddle tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern, right around that, that window. So stay tuned for that. And it's the Mile High Mailbag. So make sure you have your questions ready. And in the meantime, follow my partner on Twitter at Kelberman NFL, myself at Chad and Jensen. Zach, have a great Wednesday night, brother. You too. Tomorrow night, Chad. And everyone, favorite night of the week, favorite part of the week. Let's get it. All right, guys. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We will talk to you tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern.